presentation by Joshua Schultz, uh, whose title is Structural Assessment of Sun Charles Modified Hyper Roof. What I want to do is just dive into um, what we've been doing here, which is just the very beginnings of a historic assessment of uh, a really interesting shell structure that we he have here located in kind of the middle of nowhere, Spokane, Washington. Um, and so what it turns out uh, when we started this, man, eight months ago, um, we were told that no documentation existed. Um, so we were planning on doing a full 3D um, imaging experience and also I need to just take my map. Um, and as, as I went through all the archives, we found a whole bunch of uh, really interesting uh, images, both from actual design and construction. And then we found the full documentation of the, the plan set. Um, so what we've done from that is we're, we're working to reconstruct uh, the design um, and then compare that to what, what was done in 19, uh, 59. And so as we get started here, make sure that we can click through. There we go. So uh, to, to finish up here, and since, since this is a church roof, I thought it would be fitting um, just, just to pay attention to, of course, when we're designing with shells, um, the overall geometry seems to be the, what draws people. But of course, uh, as, as me said, God is in the details. So uh, the overall geometry was relatively straightforward to get. Um, and now what we're doing is we're dealing with the details of the, the pre-stressing in both the shell and the slab, which is kind of an interesting thing. Or um, since this is a shell and spatial structure conference, I thought it'd be good to quote probably my favorite engineer in the world, uh, Gaudi. And so the straight line belongs to men, but the curved one to God. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at this, this church here that's located in St. Charles. So we have this uh, hyperbolic paraboloid roof. Um, it has a folded edge beam. It's pre-stressed. Um, you can see the abutments at each end. This is the south end. This is the north end. It's uh, asymmetric, but it has a line of symmetry that goes right down uh, from the front to the back. The, the rear of the shell is higher elevation than the front of the uh, shell. And so this, this church historically uh, was created, the parish was created in 1950 by a merger of two other parishes. Um, and the uh, priest at the time had recently been to a world's fair and he firmly believed that you should build the best you can afford. And apparently at the time, uh, the, the parish could afford quite a bit because uh, it, they ended up raising about $325,000 uh, in, in 1959 uh, to develop this shell. And so you can see that it's a, it's a freestanding shell. It's uh, braced at each of these points on the south side and the north side. Um, it tapers from a three inch uh, thickness down to a 42 inch as it approaches the buttress here. It has the folded edge beam uh, and then the field, uh, the, the field here uh, where you can analyze uh, the field stresses. It spans 110 feet. Um, and there's a whole bunch of interesting things. I, one of the things I've tried to do, and this is why I, I, I like referencing Gaudi, is that um, even though it's a, it's a modern, so there's a lot of discussion here uh, in the US about what, you know, what we should build our buildings out of, be they federal buildings or, or private buildings. And um, while it's a modern church, there's a lot of um, historical and practical utility that surrounds why they chose the shell. So there are these unobstructed views. There's these floating sky windows here for obvious reasons because the shell's not being supported there. So you can infill that. Um, and they, the, these are actually um, from an artist that, that was in France at the time. Uh, so, so if we dive into that, uh, like I said, at the outset of this, we were planning on doing a, a full 3D scan and importing that to get our uh, geometry, but it turns out that uh, we were able to find the plan set. And what was interesting is this shell was uh, developed by T.Y. Lin, or in, in, in uh, partnership with T.Y. Lin. And so um, it ends up being uh, pre-stressed sort of throughout. So here we have the formwork and all the details for the formwork. Here you can see during the construction. Um, and of course, this at the time was, um, this was kind of in the post-war shell boom in the US. So after the war, there were a whole bunch of these shells that were being constructed, um, which was great on the design side, uh, but was very problematic for contractors. No one wanted to bid this. And so they ended up building several small models ahead of time in order to convince people to actually bid the project. So here you can see the formwork um, and here's the formwork layout. 
Um, and then we've got the standard reinforcing. Here's uh, the TY Lin stamp here. So he actually was involved in, in generating the, the actual design. We have our typical field reinforcing. We had uh, number fives at 16 inches on center. And then we had quarter inch uh, pre-stressing strand uh, that were bundled together uh, throughout here. And so you can, you can see that. And then you can see some of the layout here. You can see here's the pre-stressing that goes through um, from north to south. And then here you have your typical regular reinforcing uh, steel. Um, and then, of course, you have the pre-stressing because if TY Lin is involved, you're going to pre-stress as much as you possibly can here. Uh, so you have the, the pre-stressing down to the abutments. And then you also have uh, pre-stressing that runs through the slab um, and then gets picked up here. So the, these, these uh, sort of buttressed um, segments are, are really quite massive. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, if you want to go high, you have to dig deep. And so, um, so we have all these details here. And so um, we incorporated those into our analysis as well. Um, here's just some closer details of the abutments um, and how that, that goes into the slab. So you can see again, going back to Mies at the beginning of this, of course, um, God is really in the details here at this uh, church because uh, getting all the, the actual analysis to match up to, to what was initially designed has, has taken quite a bit of effort. Um, so here's the longitudinal and the, the transverse cross sections. And so one of the ways that we're doing uh, traditional analysis is by doing an equivalent arch analysis by taking um, cuts at these sort of worst case sections um, and analyzing those as, as arches. Um, and then the other sort of important thing was looking at this, obviously this building was uh, constructed in 19, 1959 through 1961. And so you had a series of historic loads and we had to make sure that we were on the same page and that we were using the loads that they actually used. And so um, they, they had a series of atypical historic loads here. So you can see up on the roof, uh, we have a flying nun. And then uh, at the end of construction, they actually did some live load testing here. Um, and and I, I've not been able to convince the church to allow us to do similar testing today for some reason. Uh, but in all seriousness, what we have uh, is we have the UBC 1955, uh, seismic and snore acting separately. Wind was 20 PSF, so it ended up not governing. So we found uh, there's a 30 PSF minimum snow load that comes from a historic standard that's local to the Pacific Northwest, and, and we were able to get that. Uh, so with that, and then our form work, uh, we have some beautiful force force and form diagrams actually from, from T.Y. Lin here, which is a different discussion all, all together. Uh, but we had our form diagrams. And so based on that, we were able to construct a series of models using uh, abacus and sap. Uh, so here we have our initial shell um, finite element. Uh, we have some initial deflections here. Um, and I think I can, you know, just, just some scale deflections here. The nice part about this, of course, is you can see that asymmetry of the, the rear side of the roof being much significantly taller than, than the front side of the roof. Uh, so with that then, um, what we're going to do, and we just finished up the uh, initial finite element, now we're going to start comparing that with some analytical methods, because the idea is, you know, how was this designed at the time? Um, and a lot of this, especially in the US, has become a bit of a lost art, uh, unless you happen to be working with a, a handful of, of people on the East Coast, like Professor Professor Adrianson and, and some of those. So we're, we're using some of the analytical model methods that were available at the time. Uh, so just a typical plate flexure analysis, some arch analysis, and then using a rectangular projection. So what we're doing is uh, we're going to do, do these, um, compare those, and see what we've got. And then what we're going to do is really document this uh, in hopes that this can be probably one of the, the more documented shell projects, um, certainly um, in, in the, the US, or at least on the West Coast. And then that, that can become a a accessible learning tool both for students and for practicing professionals. Uh, so with that, I, I'd just like to thank you for your time. And if there's any, any questions or any additional suggestions, especially on the simplified hand calcs, uh, I, would, I would gladly welcome those. Thank you, Joshua. So I have a curiosity from my side. Um, the, you said that the shell is pre-stressed. And uh, my, my question is, what is the direction of the pre-stressed cables? Are, are they along the generatrix of the high part or they are yeah. cut? Let me, uh, so they, they, run, they run along this curve uh, right, right here from north ah, okay. to south. Uh, and then they're anchored into the abutments. Okay, okay, so, okay. And, and so the two, the two upper corners are free you have only two, only two supports for this shell. 
Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. The stress are, are uh, uh, just in the more compressed part. And are you considering uh, this kind of stress uh, or uh, if you want to consider it in your FE analysis? That, that's what we're working on right now, yes, yeah. Which uh, uh, turns out, at least for me so far, to have been easier thought than done. Okay, and so you have only mild uh, reinforcement in the other direction. Correct, yeah. Let me uh, see if we can. Uh, okay. So uh, let's see here. So, so here you can kind of see. There are ah, okay. The question from the chat. Oh. Uh, yes, there is a question from Professor Lazzaro. And one from Giulio Mirabelli. Uh, ah, okay. I didn't see it. Okay. First, uh, Professor Giulio Mirabella. Okay. Please. Just a, 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 a question because uh, it's interesting to know if uh, you could measure actual deformations after uh, sometimes from the building, and uh, uh, this could, could uh, give a different shape of the shell nowadays. So. If you take into account this uh, long-term deformation, say. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so that's a great question. And so, what what actually initiated this whole project was the fact that uh, ostensibly the plans didn't exist, and they need to do some repairs on the roof. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, so we we've gotten together um, with, with some colleagues, and we're going to be doing some RTK uh, 3D analysis um, with, with the drone, right? And um, what I've negotiated is that we'll do that. We're doing that during this summer, so we're taking those mm. real time. Um, and then we're going to have them come out again. So uh, Spokane gets relatively large snow loads. You wouldn't see that, the ground snow load being 30 PSF, um, but, but we have snow loads that go up to you know 80 PSF, mm. so it's quite significant. Mm. So I'm hoping that we have a snowy winter, um, yep. and so then we can, yeah. So then we can have that both with the load and without. But even over time, you can see that there's been creep, um, especially on this this rear yeah. rear portion yeah. of the shell. Yeah. So what we're we're doing is we're the goal is really to try to to hone into what it, what was actually constructed and what are the actual stresses, right? Because mm. you know, in theory, mm -hmm. theory and practice are the same, and practice they're different. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> of course, of course, for that reason. Because uh, always when we make models, uh, theoretically, we make perfect model, undeformed model, and uh, we have to face uh, the already deformed shell. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Lazaro. Uh, yes, so I have a question uh, regarding the, the straight edges, so the beams in the straight edges are usually carrying the membrane shear forces to the supports. And they, are, they seem to be vertically uh, supported by some um, slender columns along the facade. Yeah, I mean, in the pictures you showed before. And therefore, I saw in your analysis that, uh, yeah, exactly. So these vertical, these vertical columns along the, um, straight edges. And so in your analysis, it seemed that the, the shell is balancing sideways and that that's not uh, very consistent with this kind of boundary condition. Yeah, uh, so we, we have included those. We didn't model the actual wall elements. Uh, we, we used the, the point supports. In the, in the GIF that I put into the PowerPoint, uh, we had just finished that up earlier this week. And so I pulled a, a gift that doesn't have that boundary support. So that's okay. very, very, very shrewdly noticed. Um, and so I was just putting something in there to show that we've actually, in fact, started the, the analysis. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Joshua.